Hey, I'm Elisa Childers, and you're listening to Wild Man and Steve. You are about to listen to the intersection of faith, talk, and music. The Wild Man and Steve show starts right now. Welcome to the Wild Man and Steve show. For all of our fans, this is a little strange. You're used to hearing Wild Man's voice first, but with this episode, I am the sole host. That's right. Our own Wild Man is not the co-host of this particular episode. Uh, I'm I'm flying solo, and um, I got to say, just a little bit nervous. Uh, You know, I usually have got my partner there with me, uh, the you know, I feel like the two of us, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like in the Bible. It's like the two of us are just like the sons of thunder, you know, and, um, and, I, and I appreciate having my brother there with me. So I've got to fly solo tonight, uh, but I, I hope that I've, I've done him proud uh, in keeping up the, the tradition of Mr. Segway. Because I've already thrown out a little thing here when I said the phrase sons of thunder. That's right. Our guest tonight are a couple fellows from the uh, new, up-and-coming uh, Christian rock band, Sons of Thunder. And when you hear who they are, I think you're going to be surprised. So we've got Kevin Music Man with us, and that's right, Pastor Wildman. Yeah, Wildman is not the co-host tonight because he's actually one of the guests. This is his band along with Kevin uh, Music Man. So, gentlemen, Sons of Thunder, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. This is this is an honor. I always wanted to be on the Wild Man and Steve show. <laughs> Listen, if you can't be a guest on your own show, then something is seriously <laughs> wrong. Okay, something, yeah. we're we're not paying somebody, right? <laughs> um. So, uh. Oh, there's so much for us to talk about in this episode. Uh, you've got a new single out. Um, you've got an EP that's getting ready to come out. We want to talk about how you guys got connected, uh, the music, the faith, and all of that. But but let's just start right off with that absolute rocking name, Sons of Thunder. <laughs> So I already made the allusion to the Bible, right? There's the, the Absolutely. Bible reference, but talk to us a little bit. How did you guys come to the name Sons of Thunder? Well, for me, that's something that's been referenced before. Uh, Sons of Zebedee, James and John, Sons of Thunder. I always thought thought that was cool. And then uh, a couple of years ago, Tora Tora released a new album. And and they made reference in in one of their songs, Sons of Thunder. So, you know, to me, Sons of Thunder, we love rock and roll. Um, You know, the big A5 power chords. It's just, you know, ACDC style, that style, you know. And so Sons of Thunder, I, I always thought, hey, if, if I'm ever in a band again, that's the name I would like. And we, Chad and I um, talked about it. Uh, and Pastor Wildman was like, yeah, I like that. So, yeah. Well, it, it conjures up, I mean, the great, the great anthem by Steppenwolf, right? Uh, Born to be Wild, where we actually have the line, heavy metal thunder. Right. So, I mean, totally, totally perfect for you guys. Um, So is it so wild man, is there any real connection you think between the original sons of thunder, James and John (laughs) and the two of you? Well, you know, that, that actually, spoiler alert here, um, some of that's going to come out when the title track of our EP comes out because one of the verses focuses on that and basically talks about how, um, I am who I am, but I need to change. And God needs to make me into what he desires me to be. 
Um, and so that that's the uh, uh, spiritual connection, if you will, to the concept of the Sons of Thunder, the idea of, you know, here these guys are, they're, they're ready just to bring down lightning bolts on anything. Um, and Jesus is like, no, no, you know, listen. And so <laughs> al- along with this idea of of Gibson guitars and cranking it, like Kevin said, is also, is, is also the idea of, all right, Jesus, God, you guide us in how you want us to go here. Absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah, you just you just mentioned Gibson guitars. We certainly want to get into a little bit of tech talk uh, with all of this and, and your equipment and so forth. But I'm going to ask the question: Why another Christian rock band? And, and and the reason I would ask that, let's face it, there is a great catalog of music. If, if there was not another band or solo artist who ever recorded anywhere on the planet ever again the world has a really great catalog of music. Uh, In fact, more than any one of us would ever be able to listen to for the rest of our lives. So why, for you two guys, 2021, another Christian rock band? Well, there's there's always room for another one. You know, (laughs) when you you think about it, um, uh, the you look at how many people still need to be influenced by music. And how many people uh, need to hear a message of some sort? Um, you know, the globe hasn't been covered yet. And so we want to take part of the globe. That's the first thought that comes to my mind. Yeah. And, and to add to that, um, I mean, we did this for the love of music. I mean, uh, Wild Man, and we've talked, you know, we, we love God. We love guitars. We love rock and roll. Um, so, so, so this is a collaboration and we just love music and we wanted to put out uh, some music and we started with simple man um so yeah for the love of music is is a big reason we did it when you talk about you know reaching you know the world the fact that there's there's always a need for that and i think about our friends uh, sweet crystal uh up in michigan and and their trademark line is changing the world one song at a time yeah. uh and hey that's that is right i think that you know it does kind of go one song at a time and if you got more bands that are making more songs and uh you know greater opportunity to to reach the world uh, for, certainly for christ jump in and talk tech because I, I know that the both of you guys want to talk equipment here so talk to us what what sorts of equipment and, and I'm talking everything from from actual instruments to other equipment that you guys used uh, to to work on this album uh, what what do you guys got in the in the workshop there yeah well one the, I'm a little different than a lot of guitar players um, I'm not big into having a bunch of pedals and effects. Um, I'm old school. And um, a few years ago, I was just tired of chasing tone. Michael Sweets talked about this. And I actually saw an ad for an ISP Theta Pro. Michael Sweet endorses them. He's got his own signature model, and and that's what I have. And what I like about my sound, so to speak, I don't need an amplifier. I simply take the ISP Theta Pro and I have hundreds of, I've got George Lynch tone on there, Van Halen tone on there, ACDC, Whitesnake, the list goes on. Michael Sweet's got several signature tones. And I just found a, a vintage, it's, it's, it's just called Vintage Classic 79, I think. And I just love the tone. It sounds very old school. Uh, I plug direct into a JBL audio cabinet and and go to town 
you know, a lot of guitar players, oh, I, I got to plug into an amp. Um, but, but a lot of venues nowadays, and, and whether it's a worship band or coffee shop, whatever, even Michael Sweet, when, when he tours, he uses his ISP Theta Pro because it's, it's just an amazing unit. Um, I think he coined the phrase uh, guitar tone in a box. And again, turn the wheel to what you want. Um, and, and for me, like I said, I'm, I'm not big into, I don't geek out on pedals and whammy bars and all that stuff. I want to hit a power chord and I want it to be loud. So, you know, I'm a little different, you know, than, than some guitar players like that in that respect. For this song, uh, my go-to guitar was my Gibson Flying V. Um, recently, I picked up the new SG from Epiphone, which is a Gibson company. And I was blown away that it, um, the, the, the power, the tone, uh, the playability, it's just a beautiful guitar. Uh, they, they, they did something that, uh, it is rare. I don't know if they've done it before, but they put Fishman pickups in the guitar and these things are just monsters. So, um, you know, simple man is tuned down, uh, and we've got the Fishman pickups, we've got the classic tone. So, so that's what I like about it. I used my SG absolutely loved it for that song. Well, it's awesome. I, I just going to say, you know, that ISP theta pro, I had the, the good fortune to see Michael, uh, at Sweetwater, uh, in uh -huh. Fort Wayne, Indiana, and he was doing a little workshop. They've got a nice little uh, theater there and just, you know, small, intimate venue. And he was really sh demonstrating, showing what, what it could do, talking with the audience and so forth. And um, I, to this day, that is the one video of mine that has, has had far and away more views than anything else I've ever posted on YouTube. Uh, so many people responded uh, really, really well to that. I definitely want to come back, talk about that flying V, talk about the SG, but uh, wild man, what, what are you bringing to the table? <laughs> oh, hey, nothing, nothing beats a Les Paul. And, and I, I've learned that over the years. When I first started playing years ago, I didn't care what I, I didn't even know anything about brands. I mean, I was 15 years old, could barely even afford one electric, let alone get into anything else. And, and then uh, eventually got into um, some, uh, it wasn't about 18, 19 years ago, I think it was when I got my first uh, Les Paul. And it was what you would call the, uh, the uh, poor man's Les Paul. It was a, it was a uh, limited edition USA Gibson made, um, but it was a faded cherry. So it was basically the cheapest Les Paul you could get with the Gibson name on it. And so I went with that. And then here, just a, just about a little over a year ago, I traded that in, as, as you know, Steve, I traded that in for um, a 94 uh, Les Paul studio. Um, and I just, I just love the feel of the Les Paul. I, I can't even explain it. There's something about the feel of the neck that just, what, that, I mean, you, you always want to continue to play, but it's just hard to put down. You just continue to play. And the same as Kevin. I never was much into a lot of effects. I got, I had one pedal when I was really playing the most I've ever played in my life when I was in high school. It was called the Boss Heavy Metal Pedal. And that's all that I had was that. I would just crank that up with one amp. Um, and, but now I, I, I just use a model, a modeling amp. And the modeling amp gives you several different options of amps, several different options of effects, several different things you can choose. But I, I've narrowed it down just to the basic classic rock amp uh, sound, and uh, and that's what I go with. Yeah, we, we've talked on on this show, and and I've talked with others as well. It, this, especially this genre, I think rock metal, um, especially lends itself to the visual. And we've talked so many times about how, uh, you know, the MTV era was made for, for metal. Metal was made for MTV. There's just some such a great visual there. And, and I certainly am a very visual person. I simply love the look of certain guitars. I just, I just love to, to look at them, right? Everything from shape to finish to, to the paint scheme, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, you guys are talking about the music of, that comes from the, the comes from the device and, and how it feels in the hand. Like you were saying, it just feels good. You don't want to put it down. Uh, do you guys geek out over the visuals of your guitars as well? Uh, do you just like to look at them and go, wow, that is a really cool guitar? Or, or that's actually part of the reason I want this guitar in addition to how it sounds. I'm also looking for a particular appearance. Oh, absolutely. Um, 
uh, the SG, like I said, has become a fan. I mean, I've always known about the SG, but once I've owned one and played it, it's like, wow, I, I know why Angus Shung now played SGs all these years. They're just amazing. The Flying V is amazing. Um, I got my first Gibson Flying V a few years ago. Love the guitar, love the looks. And there's not many V guitars that I like besides the Gibson, the Gibson Flying V. Just, you know, if you look at the contour and the shape and everything, I mean, there's a lot of imitations out there. And, um, you know, it, you know, I, I realize everyone has their preferences. You know, maybe the neck plays different, whatever. But for pure rock and roll music, uh, yeah, not only the sound, but the look, fantastic. So, um, yeah. I, I, and, and then, uh, you know, the Les Paul, like Wildman had mentioned, you know, great guitar. What I found about the V that I like so much, it plays like a Les Paul, but it feels like it's half the weight. So that's one thing I love about the V, you know. You, yeah. can, you know, when you're standing for a couple hours playing, the V is like, oh, this is so much lighter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Sometimes you do you do end up with that Les Paul shoulder after a while. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's tennis elbow and there's Les Paul shoulder. <laughs> right, right. So so tell us a little bit. How did it happen at, that you guys were able to write music? Now you guys are in different places in the United States. Am I yeah. correct? You're across the country. Yeah. Yeah. Across yeah. Country. West Coast. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, we've we've had this question also of some other guests. Uh, I, I guess I never tire of of hearing artists talk about it because, and let's be honest, we're all probably of a similar age here. Uh, the the notion of being able to to work collaboratively, but not being in the same place at the same time, yeah. is always going to blow my mind. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk about kids today. We sometimes refer to them as digital natives. Right, they've grown up in this. They they don't know anything uh, different. We are digital immigrants. We've come to the digital age, but we, we didn't uh, start there. And so, to me, this is just endlessly fascinating. How did you guys actually work uh, on on writing the music, writing the lyrics, putting the, the music together, all that all that stuff? Sure. Well, I mean, it it, it started basically. Um, I mean, the first thing was we, we met by seeing the videos that each of us were posting online of just us playing guitar. And that led to me um, connecting with Kevin and saying, hey, would you like to do something together at some point? And, you know, the digital side of things is it, it has its pluses and minuses. You know, um, I way back in 90, actually, 91, 90, I was in the studio. I was doing a demo tape. I was ready to hit the road. And I, I was just spending all this time in the studio. And I, and I shot my whole savings because I was in the studio and I just loved it. And so I missed that. Now that we're doing this project, it would be nice to be able to hang out in a studio and work together and see each other and, and try to iron some of these things out. But at the same time, having said that, if that was still what we were limited to, this project wouldn't be happening. Um, so because of the digital era and because we're able to send files back and forth um, between us and to Ray Roborn, RPM Studios, who's, who does the mixing for us, because we're able to do that, that, is, that has been a tremendous benefit. Um, and that's what's opened the door to do this right now. Yeah, it, it's all about the technology. Um, we, we've got some great technology nowadays and um, fairly reasonable price. You know, you can get, um, I use a nice Zoom uh, four-track recorder um, and, and you can, we can send riffs back and forth. We have ideas, um, you know, that's, it's just a technology. That, that's how we're doing it. Yeah. So I mean, you mentioned about sending riffs back and forth. So and I know this is different for different uh, artists, but solo or, or in, in a band, but how did you guys go at it in terms of the music and the lyrics kind of, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did you guys start off with, with the words and then you built the music around it? Did you bring both to the table at the same time and kind of start working stuff back and forth? Uh, what was your process? Well, for me, um, you know, when I started writing original material, um, I found it for me, I, I like to write the lyrics first. You've got a story that you want to tell. 
Um, writing the lyrics, I think, is harder than mu- music almost comes naturally. You know, you're a musician. So um, got a lot of riffs, you know, you're practicing or warming up. And, and so you got a lot of riffs to pull from. Uh, but for me, um, writing the lyrics, you know, putting the pen to the paper. OK, the simple man, this is the story that I want to convey. And, and, and that's how I write. And then, uh, you know, there was uh, a part in, in another song where it's like I had some of it written. And then I would send it to Wild Man and I'm like, hey, I'm kind of stumped here. Could you finish this for me and did a wonderful job finishing that up? Um, so for me personally, lyrics come first, music comes second. Yeah, and, and I think that both of us have many years of experience coming to the table that um, have kind of, for the most part, has been um, uh, experience in the shadows or experience in the background. Nothing produced necessarily. And and things that we had done already and written over the years that we would like someday to do something with. Um, and so, um, like, you know, Kevin had Simple Man pretty much already written. Um, and then he just sent me a video of it. Um, the one that I'm working on on the EP that I that I wrote, I'm, I'm sending him. I sent him a video of it last week, and just just to give each other an idea of what it is. And and you know, you, you got to take it this way. Not no offense to you, Steve, but you know, guitarists have their own language. I mean, we we understand <laughs> each other. <laughs> so I have come to understand. <laughs> well, yeah. You guys have dropped the, 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 the title Simple Man now uh, several times. So let's get into talking about uh, that song. It uh, just came out um, just shortly before this interview about a week ago. Um, and, you know, I immediately went out, uh, grabbed it off of, uh, of iTunes, uh, was sharing it all over Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then I remember I was, I was playing it for my wife and daughter. We were driving uh, to an event last weekend and I said, you got to listen to this. And so we had it in the vehicle and, and you know, playing it and cranking it up. And, um, and, and wow, man, you, you know, my family, you've, you've been with us before, you know, my wife, uh, and she's sitting in the back seat and her eyes get really big and she's hearing this sound and this song is like, wow, that is, that is really good. So talk to us about the song. Did we convert her over to the classic rock music yet? Did we do that? Did it work? You know what? There's always hope. There's always hope, Wild Man. <laughs> <laughs> hope springs eternal. Uh, All right, go ahead. But yeah, so so talk just a little bit about uh, the, the song "Simple Man." When I hear it, I hear I hear a couple of things. I hear that classic, uh, that contemporary Christian music sound, the CCM. Uh, there's there's some CCM there from the '80s, but on, on the rock side of things. It's not just, just the, the pop sound uh, of CCM, but, but I definitely hear the, uh, it, it's a popular sound. What I mean by that, it's not, you know, uber niche, you know, and, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's a subterranean, uh, uh, Denmarkian death metal with a hint of grunge. No, it's, it's not that, right? It's, it, it's it's popular. It's got a popular sound to it, but it is clearly in that rock vein. So, talk to us a little bit about what all went into that sound uh, for your first track. Well, um, starting off, like I said, I, I I wrote the song lyrically, and then you know I just love being in E minor. So, I was uh, playing and and I came up with that riff, and um, the guitar r- riff was written, and my thing. Um, my, my son, he plays the drums and, um, he's actually going to the Navy before he leaves for the Navy. I said, Hey, let, let's do something like this. Have you be a part of it. So as great as technology is, like we just talked about very difficult to mic up a drum kit. I don't have seven mics and I can't get it dialed in. Right. So what my son was able to do was play the drums and then we sent that to the producer and then those are those are real drums that you're hearing that that that's not a drum machine it, it's amazing he's got you know real drums recorded and and that was my son playing that beat at the beginning um the um our hired gun so to speak uh laid down that bass line which i think really adds to the song um we've had a lot of positive response to the song it's a very catchy tune 
people are finding themselves singing in the shower or waking up or, you know, it, it's just a real catchy tune. Um, you know, very happy with how everything turned out. And, and again, the producer had a big part of that because what I love about the song, the sound is everything is breathing. You can hear the rhythm guitar. You could hear the bass guitar. You could hear the drums. I love the solo in that song. I love Wild Man's solo because it's a classic solo. It starts off and it real tasty licks. And then he does the Chuck Berry thing. And then he's just shredding at the end. But what I like about that is we, we've we got the drummer doing these crazy cymbal hits. And you you can just hear it all. So so that's one thing I'm very happy with. I'm, I'm proud of how that turned out. The song Breeze, you can hear everything. Um, so yeah. on that for a minute we've had uh, artists before who used that exact term uh, letting the music breathe and and i think i think any of our listeners who are, are serious musicians themselves they're going to understand that they're going to understand what you mean by that uh for the casual listener who doesn't have the vocabulary who simply goes dude i like the song i don't know why i like it but i like it say a little bit more about what that means from your perspective about, about letting it breathe that way. Sure. Well, you know, different albums I've bought over the years and, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know, but you'll, you'll listen to an album and it could be from a famous band. And you're like, man, I could barely hear that bass guitar or the drums are just overbearing. It's just way too much. Um, you know, different producers have their style, their thought process, what they're trying to accomplish. Again, our producer, Ray, just knocked it out of the park. And you can just, it, it's almost like I'm listening to a vinyl record back when I was a t- teenager. You know, that's what I loved about vinyl records. Growing up, I didn't have cassettes. I did not like cassettes at all. The first time one broke, I'm like, oh, forget this. And I'd sit in my room and listen to a vinyl record. And you just had this warm audio. You could hear every symbol you could hear everything the bass you know i used to listen to kiss records and and i just used to listen like like maybe i'm listening to gene simmons bass line or or whatever that's what i mean by the song breathing you could just hear every single instrument equally there's not one thing that's overbearing or drowning the other out it's just a masterful job of mixing and producing yeah you know i will be honest there there are Bands will do stuff, especially some of our, our, our classic bands from back in the day. They're, they're, a lot of these bands are re-releasing stuff. They're remixing um, and, and so forth. And sometimes I'll listen to it and I'm thinking, I, I don't know really what got accomplished here. Uh, you mentioned Whitesnake earlier. And uh, as, as Wildman knows, uh, Whitesnake is, is, is one of my uh, guilty pleasure bands. Uh, yeah. So thoroughly enjoyed them, but they, uh, recently came out with their uh, trilogy, the the Red, White, and Blues albums, um, and and I, I got the Blues album, and wow, as I listened to it, I I could hear things so much differently, and and I know those songs very well. Oh yeah, I mean, all of them about you know fifty thousand times each, uh, and so boy, I could really hear exactly what you said. Uh, suddenly, I'm hearing bass i'm hearing drums i'm hearing vocals that that, that were distinct but fit very very nicely um with the others so let's talk a little bit about um your influences so you know wild man you you've talked about on our show and uh, for our listeners who may not see the video here um you know, you're, you're wearing an Oak Ridge Boys t-shirt. And so obviously you're a big Oak Ridge Boys fan. No, no, no. You're wearing a Petra t-shirt. So obviously Petra, big influence for you. Um, 
if you want to talk about that, that's great. I think we, we know certainly a lot about you and Petra. Mm-hmm. Any other influences specifically on your playing and singing? Yeah, um, for, for playing, um, Bob Hartman uh, was definitely the first influence. Um, when I first started taking guitar lessons, um, I had a cheap acoustic guitar from, I think it was Sears. We ordered it off the catalog. It was like 30 bucks. Uh, had It came with a pitch pipe, and I broke the string the first night trying to tune it up, trying to figure it out. And so my dad signed me up for lessons and uh, went in for my first lesson. And the teacher told me, he said, he went over a couple theory ideas with me and to get, get me started as a beginner. But he said, um, you know, next week, if you want to, if there's a song you'd like to learn to play, just bring in the cassette. You know, so I brought in uh, 1981 Petra Chameleon, uh, which was one of the greatest classic songs that Petra and Bob Hartman ever did. He had harmonized solo and everything. And so I learned Chameleon on that cheap acoustic guitar to start off with. Right. So, so yeah, definitely Bob Hartman, um, Rex Carroll, no question. Rex Carroll is my all time favorite guitarist. Um, a little bit of Phil Kagey in there that I listened to. Um, uh, and, and basically I, I just tried to keep up with those guys. You know, and I remember Rex, I mean, I would I would talk to Rex after concerts and just just he would be so available to the fans. I'd be the last one. I'd be the one annoying him. I'd be that kid that wouldn't leave him alone and ask him every question in the world. And I remember the the one concert, especially I was on their very first tour. And, um, and I was young, of course, teenager, and we're hanging out in the lobby afterwards and they're selling cassettes, telling t-shirts. And, and there it was, my eyes just went right to it. My friend's eyes didn't go there at all, but right to it. Metal Madness by Rex Carroll. And I was, what is this? And it was a guitar lesson book. And I paid it. I, I, it was like eight bucks or something, but it was, it was just, it wasn't even professionally printed. It was just like copied almost, you know? And my friend was like, you paid $8 for that. That's just paper. I said, you have, you have no idea, you know? And so I went home and I started learning Nagasaki, his amazing solo, you know, oh. and, and start, start trying my best to keep up with him. I still can't keep up with him. I'm still trying. I'm not there. Now, 30 some years later, I still can't do it. Um, but yeah, so Rex was, was, uh, was a tremendous influence um, on the playing. Um, and it was just a matter of just trying to keep up. And I just always wanted to do it. Always wanted to be the fastest I could be and always wanted to match what he was doing. Um, vocal wise, it was always John Schlitt, of course, for Petra. I would always just do my best to, to keep within his range. Um, and, and to try to keep, to, to, to hit the high notes, he would do it. I always have to shift the, the, the notes down when he got to the chorus. Um, and of course, Striper, Oz Fox, Michael Sweet, both of them, great influences. Um, and you know, as when I, I, I came from a musical family, my aunt and two uncles, they, uh, or I'm sorry, my uncle and two aunts, sorry, they, they, they traveled around and, uh, they in a trio in a gospel trio. Um, when I was a kid and I was raised around the piano and that's just what my life was. And it just, yeah, music was everything there was. And it wasn't until college that God started telling me, you know, maybe there's something different for me to put that away for a while. And, and man, it, it's amazing that, that he, that he's brought this back. And I'm thinking of, and I started working on this and I'm not sure yet, Kevin, I haven't talked to you about this yet, uh, but it, maybe not on this EP, but maybe on the next one working on a song called Boomerang, God Gave Me My Guitar Back, you know? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I like it. Now, I happen to know, Wild Man, that you also had a little vocal, uh, I don't know if you want to call it lesson, coaching support yeah, yeah. Uh, from our good brother uh, Jimmy Bennett uh, from um, uh, Victor and uh, King James, uh, the guy that we do the uh, Up On This Rock uh, Bible yeah. study uh, for, yeah. uh, on our show periodically with so uh what if you could share it with the world what what did jimmy uh give to you well um my whole life pretty much since i was um an adult i guess you could say i always have been losing my voice whether it was singing or speaking because i you know i use my voice all the time as a minister so i'm either so over, over the last 30 some years i've either been singing or speaking regularly all the time and about once or twice a year i always lose my voice always just count on it. I'm going to lose my voice for about six, seven days or so. Then it starts to slowly come back. Never really thought much about it. Just, it just happened. And I just lived through it. 
So this actually happened when Kevin sent me the first song and I started working, just warming up the vocals for it. And I could, I could feel my voice starting to strain. And so I just, I just texted Jimmy and I said, Hey, you know, do you have any opinions or any ideas of what could help something like this? Cause I can feel this already starting and I don't want this to go again. And he said, I sure do, because he went through a surgery and different things many years before a, a vocal um, coach helped him through all of it. So he he was able um, he, we spent about two hours on the phone together um, just going over warm up exercises and things to do before I speak, things to do before I sing. Uh, he tremendous influence from Jimmy um, in doing that for me. And, uh, and I can say it's made a difference. And he, he, he started helping me understand, you know, you're not a kid anymore. You know, you got to take care of those chords. You just can't just yeah. step out there and let it rip anymore. You know, like you used to. Yeah. So yeah. yeah thank you, Jimmy. <laughs> Definitely. Now, uh, Kevin, you, you've dropped some big names uh, in this episode. Uh, earlier on, you're talking about the uh, ISP Theta Pro, and you talked about some presets from George Lynch. Um, you, you've dropped the name Kiss uh, in this episode. You've dropped White Snake in this episode. Uh, you dropped ACDC early on. So you clearly got a, a, a broad background in terms of interest and so forth. Uh, what what were you geeking out on back in the day and when you were coming up as a kid and really enjoying music and so forth, uh, what really got you going? Yeah, well, actually, so my mother bought me a little FM radio. I was, I don't know, 12, 13, something like that. And at the time, we just had some um, pop, top 40 stuff. And I went to a buddy's house and he had the new Van Halen record, which was great. I heard Panama for the first time. And then um, I found this rock station and they would uh, play, they would get the metal shop show from KNAC in Los Angeles and broadcast it at 11 o'clock on, on Friday nights, I think. And, and I heard old kiss and um, kiss was probably the biggest influence on me, um, you know, mid eighties. And, and even though they were um, off with the makeup at that time, I actually preferred you know, their debut album. I remember going to the record store. It was like five bucks. I bought it and I was like, this is great music. I mean, it sounds old. The production was, you know, 1973, but uh, great songs. And so um, as far as geeking out, I was actually, I'm a rhythm guy. I didn't start off playing the guitar. Eric Carr. I saw him uh, on the Animalized tour and just blew my mind away. His drum solo, everything. And where I was fortunate is my mom's friend had a son that was like five years older than me. So in my high school life, I went to like 40 concerts. I've seen every band that I love in their prime. Wow. I mean, you name, you name them, I've seen them. And, and this was like I said, in their prime in that, you know, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, all in there. So I used to just geek out on the drums. I mean, I'd be watching whoever it was, whether it's, you know, Eric Carr or Alex Van Halen, you know, the drums always had me. And, um, I did, I did start off playing the guitar, but I always wanted to play the drums and it was just a natural thing. I was a good drummer, but my dad never wanted me to play the drums too loud. You know, I to turn that down too loud. I've been working all day and everything. <laughs> so later in life, um, I was playing drums and, um, I got in a bad accident and actually broke my ligaments in my arm. And that's actually worse than breaking bones. So I have several pins that hold my wrist together. And I realized, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this anymore. But I had played guitar as a teenager, had lessons from a professional studio musician. So he taught me, you know, the basics, how to pick the, you know, hey, Kev, you like ACDC, you need to learn the E minor chord, the scales, the chords. So I had the basics and I just love music so much. Um, it was kind of natural for me. I've got a good ear so I can. I can listen to something and see what they're playing. Um, but um, yeah, I would geek out on drums actually. But, but, but Kiss was probably the biggest influence on me um, as a young teenager. Uh, Poison came out like in 86. I actually knew about them before they hit it because we had friends who lived down there. I was really into them. Um, that's the epitome of just fun. They're just fun. I've seen them several times. People can say what they want. Forget the makeup and the image. 
they're just a great band. They're a rock band. They, they, they put on a show. You get your money's worth. Um, Striper, when I first heard um, Soldiers Under Command, blew me away. And to, the, to this day, one of my all-time favorites. Um, I really liked, uh, like Judas Priest, their twin guitar attach with Striper. You know, Michael Sweet and I was doing the same type of thing. Um, and I really like the bluesy stuff, um, the White Snakes, the Great Whites, Cinderella. I mean, that, that was a great band. Um, Tesla was another band. Uh, they're from Sacramento, California, which is not far from me. So they were actually called City Kid before and they changed their name. And, um, but but a, a great band. And uh, I, again, I, I'm fortunate because I saw all those bands in their heyday. And, and that's something that uh, I, I, I was glad to be living as a teenager through the 80s because I was able to experience all that. Oh, there's there's not there's nothing like it. And there, and there never will be again. And that's not just old guys saying that. That was just a special time. It hit right. It was the first time we'd ever had that kind of stuff. And that was just a, a magical era. You talk about the bluesy stuff, brother. Oh, you, oh, you speaking to my heart yeah. there. Uh, from, from straight up blues to, to the bluesy rock. Exactly what you yeah. said. Cinderella, especially that second album that Cinderella had. Very, very oh. bluesy. Uh, great white. A good night. Yeah. And I would love, and maybe this will be another show. Wild Man, we might need to think about this for another episode, but uh, we focus a lot on on rock and and metal uh, and and Christian bands that are using those genres. Uh, there isn't as much of of the Christian bluesy rock uh, that, that there, there, there's been some. And I, say, I think about Daryl Mansfield. I think about you know Glenn Kaiser and uh, and and some others, but but not as much. And I would love love to hear more of that. But I want to move it now to the Christian side of things and and. I really have got a separate question for each of you guys. So think about how you want to answer and who wants to go first here. Um, so, so Kevin, you've obviously got a great musical background, great taste and so forth. What's the desire on your end as a follower of Christ to, to use music in this way, evangelistic or, or encouraging other Christians kind of, kind of what's your purpose with the Christian aspect of it? And then the question for you, Wild Man, to be thinking about is, how is it different for you to communicate the gospel through music? Uh, contrast that with what you do uh, for your day job, as it were, uh, you know, preaching on Sundays. What, what, what's the difference there? So I don't know who wants to go first with those questions, but whoever wants it, take it away. Okay, well, um, so yeah, you had asked me about... Uh, the motivation, I guess, and the music for the Christian message. And, and I guess where I come from, kind of like Michael Sweet, I mean, at the end of the day, this is good, positive rock and roll music. Um, yes, we are followers of Christ, not ashamed of it. And, and, and basically anything you do in life, I, I want to honor Christ. Now, sometimes we fall short of that, but, but whether it's my job or, you know, being a dad or a husband grandfather you know what we want to honor god so this is just another way and uh like um uh, we got a little verse on our logo and and it talks about the king of kings um you know, invisible immortal the only god and and when t- glory and honor forever and you know I, I spend a lot of time in the new testament and, and when i read that i just thought this is the ultimate um verse just to g- give honor to the only god and uh, so, so that that was something that just stuck with me. That First Timothy one seventeen. So, I think it's uh, not just your music, but you know, kind of modeling Christ. You know, not being judgmental. And you know, I I grew up in a church that they were more concerned about being holier than thou than leading people, to, you know, to Christ. So, um, I'm not about any of that other stuff. You know. If it's in the Bible, if it came from Christ, then then that's what I'm about. Cool. Well, you know, it, in answer to your question about the music and uh, preaching or pastoring, um, it, I guess the best answer I could give to that is is that there's something about s- something being natural, and I think that in both cases, at least for me both cases, um, being a minister as a pastor and being a guitarist, singer, that 
there's a point that I reached that it, it was like I didn't really have to make certain that I, uh, you know, was putting forth the best effort to make sure that the message was what it needed to be. They're not because I was being lazy or lackadaisical, but because it was just, it became a part of me that everything that I, that I touched just became that message. It, it almost like it got to the point in my life where it's impossible for me to do that without honoring God in that way. It, it's impossible for me to, to play the guitar for any other reason, but to bring him glory, you know? Um, and, and when you, when you get to that point as a follower of Christ, it's it's really it's really amazing, and to be honest, I, I I would say I think that that has a lot to do with why God is kind of giving it back to me now. Because looking back on it, when I was first starting, there was a lot of myself in it, and I, I was doing it for God, and I claim you know wrote Christian lyrics of doing it for God, but man, my head was out to here, um, <laughs> even though I would act humble or whatever, and and I think that you know that the timing had to be right for God to say now, yeah, now, now you can do this. Now, now you can, you've uh, matured enough that um, you can do this now. And I think he was waiting for that point where it's just natural. It's, it's not like I have to prove anything to anybody. I just live my life and my life honors God. And I'm connected with the scriptures, whether I play, sing or preach. Wow. That, that, that is such a huge comment. And I hope I, you know, actually I hope some of our, our, our listeners would just, just pause the audio right now and just kind of stop and think about that to get to that point in your walk where you're not thinking about it. You're not trying to force it uh, or, or, or make the show, check the things off on the list. Did, did I do everything to be a good Christian today? Uh, it's, it's just natural. I, I, like you said, I'm, I'm playing guitar and I couldn't do it any other way, but for his glory. Um, again, it makes me think of, uh, you know, John uh, or John's chapter six, uh, when Jesus looks at the, the, the boys and he says, you know, everybody else is leaving it. You guys going to go too? And Peter says, well, where else are we going to go? Yeah. You've right. got the words of eternal life, you know? And so just that, that absolute uh, focus on him. So you, you've got an EP uh, that's, that's going to be uh, coming out. Uh, hopefully this, this episode's going to be coming out uh, around the time of the EP release. Uh, about, you, you, I hear you guys say about five songs you're looking for on that. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the plan. I mean, we're we're at a point, I mean, the original plan was a five-song EP. Things are flowing pretty good right now. We could sit here and go, okay, we're going to do eight songs, nine songs, ten songs. But at the end of the day, I think we're going to stick to our plan and do a five-song EP. <laughs> Summer of 2021 release. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, the question we always like to ask everybody is, uh, where where can the fans find you guys? Talk to us about social media, any kind of media, you know, uh, how, how do they find Sons of Thunder music? Well, um, Twitter is uh, at SOT Will Rock, Sons of Thunder initials, Will Rock. Um, and you can find us on all social media, not social media, sorry, all music platforms, Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music, uh, iHeartRadio. Um, search for uh, Sons of Thunder. We will be there. Um, Simple Man is the song that is out now that you're able to find. And so if you search uh, Sons of Thunder, Simple Man, you'll be able to find that and our, our whole EP, um, as well as um, our, our YouTube channel as well. And if you are also familiar with the site New Release Today, we are now connected with them. So if you search Sons of Thunder through New Release Today, you can go to our whole profile page and see all the links um, that's, that, that are available to you to watch the video and to see what platform you can use to download the music, which, of course, is any platform. So whatever platform you use to, to buy or stream your music, we're there. Awesome. So just search for Sons of Thunder on any of those platforms and your Twitter handle. I absolutely love it at S O T will rock. I feel like that's your business card. You walk up to people, <laughs> excuse me, Sons of Thunder will rock. <laughs> that is fantastic guys. It has been such a pleasure uh, having you guys on the show. I uh, can't wait to, to hear more from what you're going to be doing with that EP and uh, who knows what from there. Um, just real quickly before we go, uh, if things open up this year for social gatherings and whatnot, is there 
any possibility for you guys to play live somewhere. Well, now I'll jump in there before Kevin does, because Kevin and I haven't really talked about this much, but I was thinking about this today because I knew that that question was probably going to come up. My answer to that is if you would have talked to us back in early December and would have told us that we were going to have an EP coming out, we would have probably said, I don't know if that's going to happen and look at where we are. So, Hey, I would say what I would say is if there's any venue out there listening and you're interested, <laughs> church, any, festival, anybody, hey, give us an invite. You never know how we could work this out. I mean, we're two parts, two different parts of the country, but I'm sure we would love to be on stage rocking out, wouldn't we, Kevin? Absolutely. And and the way I answer that question is anything's possible, especially when you just leave it, you know, in God's hands. So. You know, we're, we're uh, making the, the rock and roll music. We'll see what happens, but anything is possible. Yep. Anything is possible. Absolutely. Guys, it's been an absolute privilege. Love talking with you guys again at SOT Will Rock on Twitter. Sons of Thunder on all your favorite music platforms. Uh, certainly a very special episode of the Wild Man and Steve Show. Wild Man and Steve show is now partnering with New Release Today. Find out more about them at newreleasetoday.com. And don't forget to check out our website where you can also leave us a review at wildmanandsteve.com. Thank you for listening, everybody, and we will see you next time.